thrilled to be able to welcome you to this program. It is one coming from uh, the live from the library, the Walnut Creek Library Foundation's speaker series. And uh, we want to uh, first make sure that everybody is aware of the handouts that are available. Uh, and I think most people, when you came in, uh, you were provided the handouts. Uh, but if you didn't get them, make sure you get them after the fact. Also, another thing, we're going to try to accommodate uh, questions uh, during the course of the program. But if your questions aren't asked or you don't get answers, the speakers have uh, graciously uh, indicated that they would stay around for about 10, 15 minutes after the program to answer your individual questions. So again, that's an important thing for you to keep in mind. Uh, let's see, we want to uh, indicate or, or emphasize that programs uh, presented by Live from the Library are uh, made possible by generous donations to the Library Foundation and by our program sponsors. Uh, our current program sponsors are Broadway Plaza, the Contra Costa Times, and Minutemen Press. And if you enjoy this program, please consider donating to the uh, foundation. And I know there are materials that uh, you can get uh, with respect to those donations. We certainly appreciate uh, any donations that come in. Uh, another preliminary thing is we want to let you know that the, I'll give you a little bit of heads up as to the next two programs that the foundation is putting on with Live from the Library. February 1, 2012 is a program on China. And Dr. Vincent Yip will examine China's history, culture, psyche that has laid the foundation to China today. He is going to share his pictures and experiences for the last 30 years in China. So that should be a very exciting and very interesting uh, program because, as you know, China has made dramatic changes in the last three decades. April 26th is Poetry Live. We have an award-winning poet, uh, Camille Dungy, who's going to join us in reading and discussion. Uh, for those who would like to look at her works in advance, uh, Smith Blue is one of her books. It uh, won the 2010 Crab Orchard Open Brook Prize, and Suck on Marrow is another one. Uh, again, for more information as to the past programs, as well as for more information as to programs that are going forward, we would refer you to the website for the Library Foundation, which is uh, very easily remembered, wclibrary.org. Again, that's wclibrary.org. Even I remember that one. Uh, I think it's important to also talk about uh, the fact that this is being recorded. So you will have the opportunity, just like with past programs, to see this on, on TV, as well as see it video streamed on the internet. Don't have the exact dates that it's going to be done, but this uh, little card, pick one up. It'll tell you where to go uh, to find when this is going to be broadcast. So I think it's important that everybody pick up one of these cards as well so you can get repeats. Uh, you may not get all the notes that you want in conjunction with this particular program because we have uh, some experts who are very, very knowledgeable about the, the area of, of genealogy. Uh, I want to, before we get started, also uh, indicate uh, our appreciation to Troy Hall at the Oakland Temple Visitor Center. Uh, we asked Troy uh, on behalf of uh, Kristen Anderson, who's the Executive Director of the Foundation, to see if he could uh, do a little bit of research for her because she had not had any research done. And uh, what they did through the uh, computers that they have there is they developed her pedigree chart. And not only did they develop her pedigree chart, but they developed the backup documents that confirm the accuracy of the information on the pedigree chart. So Kristen, if you wouldn't mind coming up, I'll just give this to you right now. And again, um, we're uh, expressing our appreciation very much for that having been done uh, by Troy Hall. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, before I announce the speakers, there is always something whenever I get involved with a genealogy program that I always bring out. It keeps getting shorter each time. But uh, I don't know if anybody has seen one of these before. Uh, this originally was about six times this length. And these are put together as samples for weavers. And obviously, this is an Indian uh, type uh, sample here. And you can see that 
uh, each one of these squares is unique and different. Every, every square is unique and different, but they're all connected. They're all connected through common bonds and strings. And that's what we are with our ancestors. We are each unique and connected, but we are connected and we can't really understand ourselves unless we know our ancestors. So I always like to, to think of that one before we get involved with any genealogy program. Let me take just a minute now and ask how many of you have been researching or been involved with genealogy for one year or less? If you could show a hand, our speakers would like to know that. How about uh, five years or less? Excellent. How about more than five years? Excellent. We have uh, speakers that uh, have been involved for a long period of time, and I think you're going to find them exciting and very, very informative. So without further delay, uh, well, first, before I, have I forgotten anything, Kristen? Ah, yes. Thank you. Turn off your cell phones. <laughs> or put them on stun, as I've been told. Or vibrate, whichever. So uh, that's very important so we don't have interruptions. I incidentally have worn a string tie because my ancestors used to wear string ties. So uh, let me go now to the speakers. First speaker is uh, Diane uh, DeGolia. Diane I've known for many, many years based on her extensive experience and community service. She, uh, I'm not going to take time to kind of talk about all the various things she's done. I'm simply going to focus on the fact that she is a member of the foundation's board. She is co-chair of the Live from the Library Committee uh, and has been very active with respect to this particular program. She says she's an amateur genealogist. I think she's perhaps a little bit further than that. Uh, she's just completing a book uh, with respect to her family history that she will be publishing. Uh, she's also a member of Mount Diablo Genealogical Society. She'll be the first speaker that speaks. The second speaker is Bill Slocum. Bill is a retired airline pilot who has been engaged in genealogy for over 40 years. He served in the Family History Library in Salt Lake City from 2001 to 2003, where he and his wife, who's joined him here today, uh, were supervisors and trainers of uh, approximately 100 full-time and part-time volunteers in the genealogy libraries in Salt Lake. From 2004 to 2006, he served as director of the Oakland Regional Family History Center, where he presently serves as IT specialist, ensuring that over 100 computers and their, their auxiliary equipment function appropriately for genealogical research. Martha Whitaker uh, is one of my more modest panelists because she didn't give me very much to talk about for her. But she has recently retired, October 1st, I believe, from Sutro Library. And she was the senior librarian at Sutro. And for those who don't know Sutro Library, it is the largest genealogical library west of Salt Lake City. So uh, obviously, she is uh, very uh, well versed. I can tell you what they're going to talk about, but I'm going to not do that. I'll let them each introduce their specific subjects. Jane Knowles Lindsay is past president of the California Genealogical Society, has been researching her family history for almost 30 years. She's arranged numerous cruises and research trips, so make a note of that, for uh, society members from Alaska to the Caribbean and from Salt Lake to Boston to Fort Wayne, Indiana. She recently co-chaired the very successful Ancestry Day San Francisco, for which there are materials that you should have picked up which was attended by over 950 genealogists. Uh, Jane's past trustee and council member for the New England Historical Genealogical Society. And I have, uh, uh, there's a handout that's available that you probably received when you came in that gives you a little bit of information concerning the uh, California Genealogical Society. We will be taking some questions, as I said earlier, during the course of the program. Uh, they will be uh, written by you on cards. Uh, Kristen, who has just left, will be passing those cards out and collecting them, hopefully. Uh, there they are. So, uh, you know, submit those, those cards. But again, like I say, uh, the speakers and panelists will spend uh, about 10, 15 minutes afterwards. So without further, uh, I'll, I'll, let me also tell you that Diane will be speaking for 10 minutes and the other speakers will be speaking for 20 minutes. 
no questions during their presentation. The questions will be after their presentations. So without further ado, uh, Diane, let me turn it over to you. And I get to be the watchkeeper of the time. So uh, I apologize in advance if I cut you guys off. Thank you very much, and it's really good to see all of you this evening. I don't know how many of you um, experienced having an elder in your family or a part of your life as you're growing up distributing pearls of wisdom, but I certainly had a grandfather on my mother's side who liked to tell me uh, bits of wisdom as I was growing up, and one was, everyone has a story. And as I've gotten older, I've learned that he really knew what he was talking about, and I have a story not quite as dramatic as many that I've heard, but I do have one, and it's that my parents divorced when I was two years old, and when I was seven, my father signed away his parental rights. And at that time, I was told, the Hempy family will no longer have anything to do with you, and you're not to contact them ever, now, or in the future, and you're not to talk about them. This is a closed chapter of your life. Well, I don't know what there is about kids, and maybe it was just me and I'm ornery. But when that happened, I decided that at some point in my life, I was going to know everything I could possibly find out about my hempy family. And years went by, and about 16 years ago, I decided that it was time for me to undertake this journey of self-discovery. You know, when we go in for training about genealogy, we're told that the first step you should take is that you should sit down and interview your family. And that's very wise. For those of you who haven't really been doing genealogy very long, that is a must. But I didn't have the ability to do that. So I wondered how I'd start, and I realized that the one resource I had, and I don't know how I got a hold of it, was my baby book. And in my baby book was a very simple family tree that took me back to my great-great-grandparents. And I discovered that my great-great-grandfather's name was Oliver P. Hempy. Well, I was so naive, I was so excited, I said, this is a piece of cake. I can do this. How many Oliver P. Hempies are there? I mean, it isn't like I'm going to be researching Smith or Jones. Well, life has funny ways of teaching you lessons, and this was 16 years ago. There wasn't that much available on the internet. In fact, research could be painstakingly slow. And it took me about two and a half years to find my Oliver P. Hempy. There were more than one. During that process, though, I discovered an internet site that I found invaluable, and it is free of charge. It's called findagrave.com. And I discovered that, lo and behold, my grandparents were buried right here in Contra Costa County. By the way, right now, I checked today, Find a Grave is still available, and they say that they have 72 million uh, cemetery records on file that are accessible, and I have found them to be a great resource. Well, I wasn't out to write a book at the time. As I said, I had embarked upon a journey of self-discovery. So I'm afraid that my documentation was very lax. Part of my talk is going to be what you don't do. And I did not document very well. I was on a search for information, and that's all I was about. Had no idea of ever writing a book. And I continued to struggle to find Oliver P. Hempy's parents. And Oh, I think it was at least two and a half years. Finally, one day, I went into the internet and up popped a transcription of a Daniel Hempy's Bible. And I looked at the different children and, oh, there's an Oliver Perry Hempy. Oh, the birth date matches my great-grandfather's birth date in my baby book. Oh, and so does the death date. That matches too. Well, how about that? I found Oliver Perry Hempy's parents, Mary Osterhout and um, Daniel Hempy. But I also continued to research and found a lot of discrepancies and inconsistencies online at that time, and finally felt that it was very important that we all go and visit the areas where our ancestors live. And I started doing that. In order to be very effective when you go and visit these places, you really need to know a bit. And I have found one of my best resources is this handbook it's called the Handbook for Genealogists for USA. And I look into that, and I also Google the county name, and I'm researching for the public libraries that have genealogical collections, genealogical and historical societies, and cemeteries, because as you know, I have find a grave, I go in and I find out where these people are buried. 
And by the way, a little sidebar, in the day of the digital camera now, I have a tool that my husband laughs at. It's a um, spray bottle that I fill with tap water, a clean, soft pa uh, paintbrush, a little trowel, and gloves. Because when I go to the cemetery, I don't know what I need to do to clean off the headstone. And once I've done that, my husband takes the digital photograph and we're good to go. One of the things I wanted to do was give you an example of why I consistently tell people they really need to go on site. Um, I was trying to document the parentage of Daniel Hempy, and online I kept seeing different postings saying that, oh, his parents are Mary Ann and Peter Hempy in Ohio, and I knew Daniel was born in Ohio, and Peter and Mary Ann were in Fairfield, Ohio. And I would email these folks and say, what's your documentation? And I wasn't getting any response. So we hauled our way to Fairfield County, Ohio, and I went into a library and I found a book that had a transcription of a document called Petition to Sell Lands. Peter had died interstate and his widow, Mary Ann, had to sell property in order to pay off the expenses. And in that transcription, they listed all the adult children and their spouses and all the minor children. And I scanned those very, very carefully. And there was no Daniel, but there was a David listed. So we then went on to the Court of Common Pleas and went up to the dusty old attic and pulled out the original do documents and coughed and sneezed and looked at it. It had been filed in the 1840s and looked through and very carefully noticed that the transcriber had read the name wrong. It was Daniel. So I had made it now to another generation. But I would not have discovered that if I hadn't gone to the courthouse. During all of this, a third party had learned of what I was doing and decided to intervene with my hempy relations. And she acted as my sort of angel and contacted my uncle and my aunt and made sure that there was a reunion. And they were very welcoming. In fact, very enthusiastically gave me all the information and told me memories. And my uncle got so immersed in what's going on with me and my genealogical research that sat me down and said, I really want you to write a family history book on the Hempy family. And by the way, I'd like to see it published before I die. He'll be, he'll be 92 in March. So we're talking about a little bit of pressure here. Um, in the meantime, I have been do putting uh, messages on message boards. And for those of you who are neophytes, message boards are wonderful. Ancestry.com has them. So does Roots Web, I recall. Um, and I had been putting out messages all the time and very slow in getting responses back. But I have connected with cousins who didn't know I existed who have been very enthusiastic uh, suppliers of uh, all kinds of information for me. They've even written memories of their grandparents and have given me full authorization to use anything that they've given me in the book. Well, now that I've changed my course of action, and this isn't just a journey of uh, self-discovery, I'm writing a family history book, I realized I had to go back and retrace my steps. I hadn't documented everything very well, so now I needed to go back and make sure that I documented my sources carefully. The other thing, too, is I felt a little challenged technologically. I'm not really good that way. I wanted to do the writing, but I felt that I needed some help. And I discovered someone here locally, interviewed her, and hired her. And she would, has been a great assistance to me because she helped me format the book. I did not want to write an encyclopedia. And the other concern I had was I didn't want the book to be just a recitation of names and dates. I feel that one of the values of writing your family history book is that you really, really get to know the people. When you're collecting all this data, you get a sense of them, but until you really start writing, you really don't put it in the context of what's going on in their lives at the time, what's surrounding them. And if you don't mind, I just am going to read one brief part from a chapter about Daniel and, and Mary Hempy. They moved to Tama County in 1855. After just one year of residency, Daniel and Mary held 410 acres of undeveloped land. Although Daniel considered himself to be a carpenter, he did well enough in 1856 with her farm producing 70 tons of hay, 1,500 bushels of corn harvested from 30 acres planted in that crop, 50 bushels of potatoes from one half acre in addition to 250 pounds of butter. 
It is unlikely that this couple recorded such a productive year following the winter of 1857. Although the county was familiar with severe winters, that year's was especially memorable. Snow began to fall the evening of December 1st and continued for several days. As a result, drifts existed in some places as high as 18 to 20 feet, with snow remaining on the ground for approximately three months. Everyone suffered from the hardships created by these conditions, and the survivors spoke of this as a time they'd never forget. Doing something like that really puts them in context for me, and I understand more then about what they were going through and what kind of people they were. I also want to encourage you to always go back and keep checking on the names. Keep, the resources keep popping up. We get more and more available on, online for us. And this has been very important for me. I had already finished my chapter on Daniel and Mary. Woohoo! I was happy. I sent it off to my editor, and I was getting ready for a 24-day trip in the spring. And I kept researching Daniel, and up started popping things I had never seen before. And those things were clues that led me to believe that Daniel had been married before he had married my great-great-grandmother. And not only that, but I was pretty well convinced I can. I was pretty well convinced that he had been divorced. So on that trip, we had already scheduled to go to the Salt Lake Family History Library, and when I walked in, I went to the card catalog, and I was fortunate to find the book that indeed had the record of his divorce from his first wife. I had to come home and re rewrite my chapter. I want to encourage all of you, if you haven't decided that you want to take on the writing of a family history book, please do. It is so worthwhile. It can be intimidating, but it really brings home to you what your people were like. My family, my personal family, does not have that. My wife's family has a lot of it. And it's incredible when you're able to read about what people did in the earlier times and think of what your kids are going to and grandkids are going to think about if you write your own. But um, Bill, why don't we talk a little bit about the internet at this point? Sure, I'd love to. Thank you so much, uh, Rich. Uh, I'm here tonight because of my friend Rich who says he wears that bolo tie because it's, it reminds him of genealogy. I think it's because he doesn't know how to tie a necktie. <laughs> but welcome to live and mostly live from the library. I'm the mostly live part. Um, I'll do my best. I've got Rich fooled and most of the congregation in the, the church that we attend uh, into thinking I'm an expert in the field of genealogy. I wouldn't call myself an expert. But due to my advanced age and uh, my experience, I, I do have a lot of experience in um, doing genealogy. I've been at it for almost 50 years. And tonight I want to talk about computers. Computers have become to genealogy as men or women have become to men. And that's uh, you can't live with them and you can't live without them. <laughs> I, I'm sure you all know what I mean. Um, I'd like to set the stage by relating some of my experiences that I've observed in this uh, pursuit of ancestry. Uh, I began being interested in family history first when I first learned about a great adventurer whose name was Joshua Slocum. He sailed around the world, the first man to ever do it single-handedly, in a 37-foot sailboat that he had uh, spent the better part of a year rebuilding. It had been sitting up high and dry for a, a number of years. Uh, his adventures are chronicled in his book, Sailing Alone Around the World. So out of vanity <laughs> and nothing else, I, I fancied myself quite a great sailor too. I taught myself to sail in high school. I wanted to be attached to Joshua Slocum. I wanted to be able to say, yeah, he's my great, great whatever, and <laughs> brag about that. And so that's why I began uh, pursuing genealogy and eventually led to me joining the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but we won't, that's neither here nor here, there tonight. But I, at least I did begin the quest, and it's really not important why you do it, it's just important to do it, as Diane said. It was easier for me than most in the early days because in the early days, research meant traveling to locations, 
traveling to libraries, distant libraries, and doing the research. Also, it, in, it involved lots of correspondence with other people who were doing research elsewhere, and it was all done by what we nowadays refer to as snail mail. I was fortunate because the airline would fly me to many of these cities in the United States, and uh, they even paid to have me stay there overnight and sometimes through the next day and give me time to go to the local libraries and do research and things like that. And it wasn't long before I found out that this was really a great fun thing to do. I seem to remember also that it required an annual pilgrimage either to Salt Lake City to spend a, a week or so at the library in furious research or to a Sutro Library here in San Francisco or maybe back to uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana to the Allen County Library. This was uh, uh, always resulted in enormous quantities of copies of records and books and uh, all sorts of things that you could dredge up at these uh, archives. The problem I always found was that I couldn't keep it all organized. I had hundreds of pieces of paper and I had absolutely no idea how to organize it. That's when we used to write everything down on paper pedigree charts and family history group or family uh, group sheets. We just wrote it all out by hand and then tried to put it together and make sense out of it and all that. It just, uh, I found myself being uh, caught up in in uh, short periods where I just worked to get organized and then much, much longer periods where I just kind of kept throwing papers on top of the stack, you know. Then along in the 80s came a, a new device. It was called the PC. And it dramatically changed the art, the black art of genealogy. At last, I could organize and I could keep track of the results of my research with a relative degree of ease. The DOS, the DOS software was clunky, but it got better as, as computers themselves got better. And they continued to advance. And so data storage and management was pretty much conquered by that, uh, this marvelous invention of the computer. And that's pretty much what it stayed for about 15 years. It was merely a device to organize and store your data that you had found some other way. And then in 1997, a company called Ancestry.com was born. They started out with 50 subscribers, with 55 databases, with, get this, 115 million records. <laughs> Family Search debuted two, two years later in 1999 enter phase two of genealogy research. Now one could sit at home in his pajamas if he wished and do research. <coughs> it took some time for this to catch on, but the tiny sparks that were generated in 1997 have now been fanned into an absolute wildfire of genealogical research. And according to the real experts, you ain't seen nothing yet. They estimate that there will be more made available on the internet in the next five years than it has been up until this date, just in the next five years. Presently, the number of records available in internet digital form increases by over 100 million records per year, and that number keeps growing every year. Ancestry.com now boasts 7 billion records, by far the largest uh, group of databases for genealogy that exists. Family Search has 2.3 billion. A new company, it's only been in business three years, they're down in Palo Alto or Redwood City, I'm not sure which, called archives.com has 1.6 billion. And it has been selected by the National Archives to debut the 1940 United States Federal Census, which will be coming out in April of next year. Family Search is opening a new and its third server center, data center, in uh, Kansas City with 630,000 square feet. That's 13 football fields of floor space just to house servers. 
<laughs> Whoa, yeah, that's right. <laughs> 125,000 volunteers are indexing and digitizing those archives uh, of the, of the uh, Family Search uh, company, which has about 3 million microfilms of records, which have been gathered over the last 75 to 80 years. Ladies and gentlemen, you are, are you beginning to get a glimpse of uh, what's possible or even probable? What we'll see over the next five years, let alone in our lifetime. What an exciting time to be involved in or be starting to become involved in genealogy. Now let me talk briefly about the handout that I gave you and I hope you all picked up the handouts on your way in. I developed that handout with a lot of help from <laughs> Pro Genealogist, which is a subsidiary of Ancestry.com. Actually, I just copied it off the internet. <laughs> Did a few changes, updates, things like that. Uh, but the, this was developed by uh, Corey Meyerink, <coughs> excuse me, Meyerink, who is uh, uh, a vice president now at uh, Ancestry.com, and he's in charge of the subsidiary, the pro genealogist. He, he himself is a professional genealogist. He's worked for the uh, Family History Search Department, uh, our Family Search Department uh, in uh, Salt Lake, and now he's in Provo with Ancestry.com. He teaches regularly at Brigham Young University, both history, church history, and family history. Actually, he made this up from an article in Digital Genealogist, which is a monthly magazine that's published to help people learn how to use the internet to do genealogy. It's a great magazine. If you're going to be involved, it's probably worth the money to subscribe. But I'm not doing commercials here tonight. But these are 50 of the most popular sites. Now, popularity doesn't usually denote uh, quality, I realize that, but in this case, most of these are measured by uh, visits to the site or hits, and most of those hits, probably 95% of them are return hits, and so I think the correlation is probably fairly high. Uh, anyway, uh, there are 50 there on the sheet. Um, I've shown the sites that are available at the family or at the, at the Oakland Family History Center where I work. Uh, after at the end of the sentence that it describes the site. There's also some numbers in brackets there. Those are the numbers that show the rating of that site for the last three years also. So it gives you some idea of the trend of that site. I want to point out that Find the Grave, which was mentioned earlier by Diane, is number three. It ranks number three. It's really a great site, just like she said. She couldn't live without it, and neither can I. The list is kind of overwhelming, and I realize that. Uh, so I would, my advice to you to, would be not to try to use this whole list or, or to tr try to use every uh, website on the list. In fact, my advice would be, as if you're just starting especially, to become proficient in two or three at the most of these sites and then branch out and use some of the others. Now, the exception to that would be if you had a specialty reason to reach out, for example, if you were doing it, uh, you're trying to find immigration records for uh, uh, an ancestor, you'd go to Ellis Island and you'd do the research there because that's uh, the, bi the biggest site for that sort of thing. Uh, after the 50 most popular that the uh, pro genealogist came up with, I came up with uh, seven of my own. I think only six are on the sheet. I'm going to ask you to add number seven. Uh, I've found that when you're doing genealogy, almost as important as who is uh, where. Uh, the information is particularly helpful to, to yourself and to others when you want to do research into people. As, I mean, you have to know where to look. And once you know where to look, you're more apt to find much more about that ancestor because many, many uh, county histories that, that contain biographies of upstanding citizens and many, many local records exist that don't manage to hit the big time, so to speak, but they're there. And if you know where to look, you know where you'll find them. 
And the other thing is that when you start finding these records, it, start, it begins to put meat on the bones of those dead ancestors of yours. And that's the important part of this genealogy, to find out who they really were and what they really were, and maybe even get some insight into, into why you are who you are. My first five uh, that I've put on that list are always in my bottom tray on my computer when I'm doing research. That's the, and the three Google sites are, maybe I won't have all three of them open, but I'll always have Google open. It's just invaluable, even though it's not a genealogical site. It's by far the most powerful and best search engine that exists on the internet, and it's amazing how much genealogical data is available through Google searches. In fact, there's even a book that was published, I think, about two years ago on how to use Google for geneal genealogical research. I mean, that's the whole book is just about using Google for doing your gene genealogy. Uh, the other site that I mentioned, <coughs> that uh, a non-Google site, is the Steve Morse site. Now, Steve Morse is uh, a, a San Francisco genealogist, and he's also a computer wizard. And so over the years, he's put together many helpful links to uh, research, and I would, I would advise all of you to have a look at that site, uh, stephenmorse.com, and just spend a little time and look at it and study it and see what there what there's, is in there for you. It's very heavy for Jewish research, it's very good for New York research, it's good for Eastern European research, but it's also just good for genealogical research, so uh, it's a great site. And then the one I would like to ask you to add to your sheet of paper is called, it's a brand new one came out this year, so you won't see this on any of the papers. It's called Mocavo, M-O-C-A-V-O dot com. And it's a conglomerator, similar to a kayak uh, in the travel industry, wh where they don't have any databases of their own, but they, co they connect you, they do searches and they connect you to links to many, many, I think they're advertising right now, eight billion, I think I s that's what I saw on the website eight billion names. So it's, pretty, it's a pretty handy site and it's a free site, so I would advise you to do that. So I'm just about to close here and in closing I, I am going to give you a little commercial message. Uh, I'd strongly re recommend to all of you to take advantage of the things that the church, the LDS church provides. The Family Search website is a phenomenal website. It's ranked, what, number four I believe, yes, number four. But it, it, but it does more than just do searches. It has links to blogs, it has free data management, it has links to free data management programs if, you don't, if you're not presently using one, you're looking for a, a program to manage your, your uh, genealogical data. There are four of them there that are listed that are all wonderful programs and uh, they have a free version and they have an advanced version that has many, many more tools. Most of them sell for about $30. They have one for the Macintosh, of course that sells for twice as much. Uh, <coughs> uh, I would also have you um, look at the brochure that uh, I have from our uh, Oakland Regional Family History Center. It's a small uh, beige colored brochure. If you haven't picked one up, please do. Uh, the Oakland Family History Center is one of 16 regional family history centers that the church sponsors. The regional centers are, are much larger and they have much more uh, available than the local centers such as Concord and Danville. And I don't mean to put them down, but, I'm, but there is, it's just, uh, uh, there's just much more to learn at the uh, regional centers. Uh, the brochure advertises the center and tells you all that we have there. One of the things I'd like to mention is that in conjunction with the California Genealogical Society, who Jane down here was going to, is representing tonight and she'll talk to you about it. Uh, we've been offering uh, genealogical courses, training courses on how to do certain facets of genealogy now for the last how many years, Jane? Four, Four years and we hope that continue to do that for many more years. We also work with the Jewish Genealogical Society from, from Bay Area and the East Bay Genealogical Society, and then we have a, a number of uh, college uh, classes that, are, that come in and use our library for teaching. 
But the best part is not mentioned in any of the brochures or anything, and that's the volunteers that work there. There are almost 100 volunteers that work there, some of them as many as uh, three days a week. Most of us work one or two days a week there. But uh, it's all free with no obligation and no pressure. Uh, you can sit there and you can occupy as much of their time as you want, and they'll, te they'll sit and they'll in introduce you to the search methods and the data management methods and they will hold your hand and help you do your research. It's just a wonderful way to get started in genealogy. So I thank you so, oh, I, I also have to mention the Concord Center. It uh, just recently reopened after being closed for a year and a half to remodel. It's located at 3700 Concord Boulevard. And if you want to go there, the phone number is 925-686. 1766. They're open four days a week and some evenings. Then also there's a, a, the Danville Center located at 2949 Stone Valley Road in Danville. And that phone number is 925 552 5920. And they too are open four days a week with I think two evenings they're open. So thanks again for your attention. I hope I've been able to. Uh, at least entice you to uh, put forth more effort into genealogy and into uh, learning how to use that internet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> now, Martha, I uh, served in the Army. Uh, does that have any impact with respect to genealogy? <laughs> yeah, it, it can, it can, it can. Um, Okay, I'm talking about U.S. military records today. Uh, if I look a little tense, it's because I'm convinced I'm going to try to push my chair back and I'm going to fall off of a narrow platform that we're all sitting on. So, excuse me if I look uh, dirty. I'll do that for you. Okay, <laughs> thanks. And thanks for coming out tonight on a dark and stormy night. Uh, my handout is the green one. It has a number of resources and for the benefit and for the benefit of people who will be watching the broadcast. I'm going to spell out some of the um, uh, words or websites that I'm referring to. The single most important thing to think about uh, when you're looking for military records is that the development uh, of a large standing army is a post-World War II development in the United States. A standing army is one that is uh, there, whether called upon or not, staffed, usually at the officer level by career um, military men with perhaps uh, volunteers or draftees coming in and out. That's post-World War II. Prior to that, the United States always had a standing army, but it was quite small. We didn't have anybody invading our borders, pretty much. Um, and what they relied upon for military service were what used to be called state militia and is now called the National Guard. And you're well, you may be, you're, I'm sure you're all aware that we're sort of inching back towards that a little bit with the number of National Guard call-ups for overseas service. When I went to the California National Guard website and noodled around, it's really hard to find anything on that website. They had the little factoid that in World War I, 40% of the Americans who served overseas in World War I were National Guard troops, which even though I knew we had a small standing army, it was still surprising to me. So the one thing you have to keep in mind in doing military research is there's no such thing as the army. There is the standing army, the United States Army. There's also National Guard slash state militia troops. And the records are not necessarily all going to be in one place. Um, I'm mostly going to be referring to the army, but there's plenty, plenty of Navy and whatever that small subset of the Navy is. Uh, I forget what it's called, but they like to parade around in fancy uniforms, and they have toy drives. Uh, some of you may be aware of whatever that, that title is. Um, for 20th century military record requests, um, this is from World War I onwards. You can go to the National Archives and Record, Administ record Administration um, website. That's a federal agency at www.archives.gov, -E G-O-V. 
Uh, right on their homepage is a link to looking for veterans' records, either for genealogical purposes or for your own records. Those who served in National Guard units may or may not be um, in some of the records on that site. Uh, the archives.gov site also has records for pre-20th century wars. Uh, most of those resources are also available on microfilm. Uh, some of that's at the Sutro Library. Small amounts of it are at the National Archives branch in San Bruno, which uh, all of the uh, branches of the National Archives collect federal records for the area they serve. The one in San Bruno is the Pacific area, which is north of the area served by the one in Southern California and south of the area served by the one in Seattle. Um, this is the you know, combination of the military and government, so how clear would you expect that to be? Um, okay. The earlier records, in, in addition to military service, can include things like pension applications and bounty land records. Back in the uh, 16, 17, 18, early 1800s, if you served in the military, you often were then eligible for a land grant. That was part of the U.S. Uh, settling uh, everything west of the states that border the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, you can also use Ancestry.com to find enlistment records for both World War I and World War II, plus draft records. Draft records are somewhat in quotes uh, be because they were records not just of people who might have actually been um, drafted into the Army, but it was more of a census of males up to the age of about I think 68, 65, 68, 70. Uh, Ancestry.com, A-N-C-E-S-T-R-Y.com, which you've heard about quite a bit already, is a subscription database. That means you have to pay to uh, find things on it. They have a few free sites, but basically it's a subscription site. A lot of public libraries have subscriptions to Ancestry.com, but unfortunately, Contra Costa County Library System is not one of those libraries. It is available at the Pleasanton Library. You have to go down to the library to use it. Ancestry does not uh, let libraries um, have off-site access to a uh, subscription. However, you can also use Ancestry at the Family History Centers you've already heard about. Uh, the one in Concord, the one in Danville, the much larger one in Oakland. There's a number of other family uh, history centers around the area. Family history centers are located in, uh, in or on the grounds of buildings uh, of the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, also known as the Mormons. Uh, as was already mentioned, they, those uh, family history centers are uh, open to the public. You do not have to be a member of the church to use a family history center. As a matter of church policy, there's no proselytizing or evangelizing of people who go to family history centers. I mention that as that can be an issue or a concern of some people. Um, there is a charge, of course, for photocopying or printing out from the websites. And uh, the family history centers in both Danville and Concord both have uh, Ancestry.com subscriptions, as well as subscriptions to a number of other paid databases. Uh, some enlistment and draft registration titles are also free on the FamilySearch.org site that was already mentioned. That's F-A-M-I-L-Y-S-E-A-R-C-H dot O-R-G. That's Latter-day Saints website. The home screen, you're in the records section. On the left-hand side, scroll down to a list of locations and click on USA. And then on the next screen, on the left-hand side, click on military records. And that's going to produce a nice alphabetical list. Uh, Ancestry.com has a lot of great things going for it, but it does not have a really good way of arranging its databases. If you look on any of their uh, links to see all of our databases or see our military databases, they're not in alphabetical order. They're not arranged by state. I mean, who knows how they're arranged? I think they pick things uh, randomly out of a hat. Latter-day Saints uh, website, FamilySearch.org, does a far better uh, um, work uh, than uh, Ancestry.com does. One of the things you can find on 20th century draft registration records um, are, <coughs> excuse me, are a um, 
the name of a next of kin or somebody who will always know what your address is. And if you are extraordinarily lucky, your World War I an married ancestor, John Jones, will have listed his next of kin as his wife, Susan Jones, rather than the ever more popular Mrs. John Jones. <laughs> and, you know, it's not, it's, you know, you may very well be wondering what her first name is. And like I said, if you're very lucky, you might be able to find it on one of those draft registration cards. The best bet for military service records prior to World War I are the Adjutant General reports for the states. Adjutant <coughs> is A-D-J-U-T-A-N-T, General, G-E-N-E-R-A-L. <coughs> Excuse me. The Adjutant General is the personnel officer for each state's National Guard units. There's also a United States Adjutant General who performs the same function. State adjutant generals frequently produced annual reports, which included at least the names of the officers in each of the military units, but often included the names of everybody in the units. That's, in, that's uh, possible in part because you didn't have a large uh, number of units and you didn't have a huge number of people in each one. The ones that have been reprinted the most often are the reports that adjutant generals issued for the various wars, including um, the northern states in the Civil War, uh, all the states or many of the states uh, for all the other wars and the biggies, big wars in the 19th century are uh, the War of 1812, the, Civil, the Mexican War 1846 to 1848, which is a big deal in part because it meant California was part of the Union when they discovered gold in California. Uh, the Civil War, records are mostly for the North, uh, there's, there are, there's some pension records for the South. And the Spanish-American War, a very little known war, is what happened in the Philippines after the Spanish-American War when it became a U.S. possession. That's called the Philippine Insurrection, and it meant that U.S. troops were there well after the end of uh, the Spanish-American War. Uh, if you have an ancestor who was born before 1880, you can find him in the 1880 census, and maybe he's a child, and you can find him in 1910, and you can't find him in 1900. You might want to try on Ancestry, when you're looking in the census, to type in as a location the word military, and that's going to, they'll, then they'll fill out the rest of it for you, and it's going to be military and naval bases. Uh, they may, may very well have wound up uh, in the Philippines uh, as a member either of a National Guard unit or as a military, uh, 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 the Army itself. Um, many adjutant general reports are on Ancestry.com, although I have to admit, um, Ancestry uh, added a lot of adjutant general reports that are in print at the Sutro Library, and I don't seem to find those on there. So I don't know if that's only available for people with paid subscriptions and a limit, less, uh, limited number of those uh, available on the ones in libraries. Um, there's also a, a fair number of adjutant general reports, particularly about the Civil War, on a free website, which is archive, A-R-C-I-H-I-V-E dot org, O-R-G. There's no S on the end of archive in that site. Uh, limit your search to texts, because it also has videos, it has a huge assortment of full text material free online. And to look for adjutant general reports in their search box, which basically does a keyword search, type in adjutant general and the name of a state. Or you could try adjutant general United States, and then you'll pick up a huge list. Uh, if you include the state, it's going to limit it to the state reports. If you say United States, you'll get the state reports plus some federal reports. Again, you can then read the book online. Uh, now, that's marginally tricky because these things aren't indexed. And they're often arranged by the name of the military unit, and you probably aren't going to know the name of the military unit. That's the whole point of using these things, is to find out what unit your ancestor served in. Once you have that unit, you have the names of it. Um, you have, uh, and, and for Civil War and for the big wars, they tend to mention everybody in them. For the other annual reports, it's often just the officers. Um, you can then use other resources to find out what that particular unit was doing in that particular war. 
Um, there are print copies of various um, adjutant general reports at the Sutro Library in San Francisco. The California State Library in Sacramento has California adjutant general reports, and the California Secretary of State's office, also in Sacramento, uh, has California adjutant general reports. Um, there's also a military museum and library in Sacramento that probably has some attorney general reports, perhaps from outside the, uh, of California. They don't have a library catalog. Their website is www.militarymuseum.org. Um, you can use that to get in touch with them and find out what they might have. Um, 18, um, 2011, of course, is the um, 150th anniversary of the beginning of the U.S. Civil War. So there are uh, a huge number of Civil War sites out there. Uh, if you go to familysearch.org, on the right-hand side, there's a link to some of the Civil War uh, military materials they have, as well as, and we'll also include some information on classes, online classes or courses that you could use to do further military research. Um, one of the things you need to know about the South in the Civil War, I mean, those, those records are available. There's pension records from the South. Um, after the Civil War, people who had been in the military or had been identified as strong supporters of the South were asked by the United States government to take an oath of allegiance to the US government. And some people did not want to do that. And a number of Confederate people from the South, Confederate soldiers, their families, <laughs> left the United States. They went into voluntary exile. And there's a number of books out there about groups that went to specific locations. You can go to an online free site, www.worldcat, W-O-R-L-D-C-A-T dot org, O-R-G, which is a uh, conglomeration of library catalogs from around the US. If you do a search in that catalog um, on, that, on their website, <coughs> which is a, a um, keyword search for Confederate exile or ex exiles, you're going to come up with a very long list of titles about those exiles. And that's the way to track down people. You may have somebody who was in 1860 who you believe did not die in the Civil War. This is again from the South. You've maybe found them in 1880 because, frankly, a lot of these exiles came back. Uh, but you can't find them in 1870. And one possibility is that they went outside the country. My handout lists uh, three titles for them. I'm sorry, two titles for them. Um, one of them is about uh, Confederados. I'm not spelling this out for the uh, people watching on TV. Old South immigrants in Brazil. That group was still going strong when Jimmy Carter was governor because the Sutro Library has that copy. And in it is a photo of Carter visiting that uh, group in Brazil. Most of the people that um, went into exile either died where they went or they just turned around and came back, sometimes after a number of years. Um, another book on there is Confederate Settlements in British Honduras. That today is called Belize. Uh, that's a great book. It's got lists of all the family members, the hotels they stayed at, the ship arrival lists, and then they, that group uh, disappeared. But those are two hints for finding people that were from the South that you can't find, uh, find later on. Um, another possible reason for not finding Civil War um, soldiers in the 1870 census is that they may have been captured in the course of the Civil War by the Union side. And they may have become what the slang term calls galvanized Yankees. Um, Confederate soldiers who were captured were at one point offered the chance to um, join the Union Army with the guarantee that they would not fight the South. They would be sent to the West to fight the Indians. Now that, of course, freed up some Union soldiers, but you know that's sort of a little distant. And a fair number, or well, at least some Confederate soldiers took them up on that. They were called galvanized Yankees because steel is blue, but they were the galvanized steel is gray, which is what they were. Um, they may have stayed in the West after the war was over. They may not have immediately returned home. Um, one thing you can do in 1870, if you can't find them in the South, 
is you might try doing a census search for the areas that were called territories in 1870. So you have Montana, Idaho, um, Indian Territory, which is Oklahoma, uh, a number of other states who, that were not yet states, but try searching for them too. And there is a book on my list called The Galvanized Yankees. I don't think that book has a lot of names, but it'll give you their history. It's by D. Brown, who I think is also the person that wrote um, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. <coughs> Another source for military information are lineage or hereditary societies based on descent from someone who performed military service. Um, the, those society, the most well-known of those societies is the Daughters of the American Revolution. Slightly less well-known are the Sons of the American Revolution. It really takes an organization of women who've spent all their lives being secretaries of committees to really run an organization that stays put and produces a lot of material. Um, just a small comment. Um, they tip, those organizations typically produce a lot of material about uh, ancestors or patriots who are qualified for membership and um, then quote, all you have to do is work your way back to one of, one of those people. Um, if you'd like a list of many of those lineage societies, you can email the Sutro Library at sutro, S-U-T-R-O, at library, L-I-B-R-A-R-Y, dot C-A, dot G-O-V, and ask for the handout titled Societies Based on Military Service. <coughs> I prepared that for the hour-long talk. Are we running out of time? Okay, I'll talk really fast now. Uh, the single best printed source for information on war is U.S. Military Records, A Guide to Federal and State Sources by James N-E-A-G-L-E-S Nagels. That's at the Concord Family History Center. It's simply outstanding. It has almost 200 pages of information about resources in state archives relating to military service. It has a great bibliography of books about military service generally by wars, and it has a long list of wars the US has been involved in. Um, finally, I'm just about done. Cindy'slist.com, I left it off my handout, C-Y-N-D-I-S-L-I-S-T.com. It's a free website with links to 20 million other genealogy sites, most of them free. It has a nice um, table of contents, uh, it's called Categories. You can scroll down to United States, you can click on a state or you can click on United States and then click on Military for links to military sites and there's other some other wars that are specifically mentioned in there. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. <coughs> one, one of the problems that we have is that each one of these topics can be talked about for at least an hour and a half. So the speakers are trying to very hard to, to limit it uh, so that we do have some questions. Uh, again, if you do have questions, put them on a card, get them over to Kristen, uh, because we will have a few minutes uh, at the end of the program. Uh, I did have a couple of uh, my own questions. How many uh, of your ancestors came across on the Mayflower? How many fought in the Revolutionary War? It's pretty impressive. Those that haven't raised your hands, you may find that uh, it, when you do your research that uh, you have ancestors that did that, fought in the Civil War, uh, came across in some of the other, as well as the Mayflower and others. So in any event, um, what happens if I hit a block? Jane, maybe, maybe you can help us with that. Okay. Hello. Um, I'm with the California Genealogical Society, and I hope someday you'll come and visit us. You, a lot of you picked up the brochure. Um, how many of you have brick walls? <laughs> how many are there Irish brick walls? Ah. Yes, me too. <laughs> um, one of the things that I've discovered about brick walls is that um, a lot of them actually can be broken down. A lot of them can be tipped over um, because we always don't know what the records are that we need to look at. So many of our um, people nowadays really use the internet as their main source of genealogical resource. And it's, it's a great, great resource, don't get me wrong. But there are millions and millions of other records that are never going to be digitized or won't be digitized in the next five years. As um, <laughs> there's, there's probate records, there's land records, there's all kinds of records. So I want you to think about 
what else you can use. And we all use the internet. As um, Bill said, we do it in our pajamas, and I'm one of those as well. Uh, we also think about getting birth, marriages, and deaths. Pretty much when you first start doing genealogy, that's what you do. You look at books in the library, you go and you look for birth, marriages, and deaths, and you don't find anything. But I want you to start thinking about some of the things that actually other people have mentioned today. Um, land records, which Diane mentioned, are one of the ladies that does talks for us at the library says that if she had only one record that she could ever have, it would be a land record. And as Diane mentioned, sometimes those records will list all the children, where they live, you know, where, they ca where they're coming from, who their spouses are. So if you have a brick wall, think about looking at records that will list other members of the families. I don't mean to put the men down, but sometimes men tend to go back on their male line, but 50% of their lineage is their mother or their grandmother. And sometimes those women are more talkative and keep better records than the men. So sometimes that's an important thing to think about. We all um, think about probate records or wills. Many people died without a probate. Um, I had an ancestor who was very, very poor, and I went and I looked, I said, well, he's not going to have a record, but there was this little teeny, um, it was smaller than this, piece of paper in his probate index listing that he had $88.61, and they divided it eight ways and listed <laughs> all of his children. So that was it, but guess what? It really helped. So you need to think about that. You need to think about who is um, the witness to a land record. You need to think about who a witness was to a probate, because generally they were either good friends or neighbors or somebody, maybe a, a son-in-law, maybe the name doesn't ring a bell, but somehow they were connected to that family. Um, as I mentioned, sometimes you need to go and look at the spouse's family, because someone may have written a history about the spouse's family and said, oh, by the way, he married this man who was the son of these people. And that might be just the one you need to break your brick wall. Um, a lot of people forget that um, way back, not, not so much now, there are different kinds of records, but way back, even in, uh, for example, in New Hampshire or Massachusetts, and in some of the early New England um, and East Coast states, they had town records. And people didn't necessarily um, do birth records, but when somebody moved into the town, they'd list the family. Even if they weren't born in the town, they'd list the family. So there's, there's opportunities for us to look at records other than just your basic records that will help you. Um, sometimes court records. Um, unfortunately for uh, me, I, I have a friend in Quebec who was looking with my gran for my, uh, my grandmother's family, and um, we found out that um, there was a court record on my ancestor because he had beaten his wife. But we at least knew that they were married, and <laughs> we were having trouble finding that. So uh, there's just all kinds of things that you can find that might give you that little extra clue to break, um, break your brick wall. Um, people oftentimes forget when they're doing research that many people did have a religion. Not everybody, but very early in our, in our country, people were congregational, or people would come over and they'd, they'd belong to the Quakers. Those records sometimes can be very, very helpful. You want to think about their ethnicity, because if somebody, like for example, a lot of my husband's family um, were Germans from Pennsylvania, and Swiss from Pennsylvania, they all belong to German churches. The records are in German, but they're there and you can find them. Those are the kinds of things that you want to think about. Bill men or uh, Diane mentioned, or Bill mentioned Find a Grave, and Find a Grave is wonderful. And it's one of those things that you too can contribute. You can, if somebody gets a record for you and somebody else writes and says, can you get a record for me at um, Mountain View Cemetery or one of the other cemeteries? We have friends in our society that go and take those pictures and give them to them and put them on the internet. And it's a, it's a wonderful free, free resource. You never know what you're going to find. Um, sometimes you will even put genealogies on Find a Grave. Um, I was looking for one one day, I have to say, the, I was asking this man a question and um, being really nice about it because I was questioning something, 
for me, and he, and he didn't answer me, <laughs> but the record's there and it gave me something to think about. Was my genealogy that I was doing for this person wrong, or was his genealogy an error? And um, it gave me another opportunity to see if I could break the brick wall that way. People oftentimes um, don't use city directories. Um, we're especially lucky in um, the San Francisco area. If you have people that were five generations or so in San Francisco, um, and you have the earthquake um, that's destroyed many, many of our records, you, you can look at city directories. And don't just look at the index of the names. Look at the businesses. You know, look at the reverse directory to see who else is living, you know, near your, your families. It's, it's incredible what you can find out from some of these other resources that we don't often think about initially when we're looking for um, solutions. Um, someone mentioned about contacting local libraries, but there are also local historical societies, local genealogy societies. And, and actually, the, the local town or county library, oftentimes if you contact them, they may have histories um, or obituaries or things that you can get that you wouldn't normally be able to get anyplace else. Um, even San Francisco, you can write to them once a month and they'll send you three obituaries for free. And many libraries do have services like that. Um, in San Francisco, they have a lot of mortuary records and. Um, there's a whole set of them on Ancestry.com now that are absolutely phenomenal because not only do they have the mortuary record from I think it's like 1880 or something to some, sometime in the 1900s, they have the, the obituary notice taped on the uh, record and sometimes they even have the death record. Um, as an aside, you should always look at the next page or the page before. Um, one of my friends was looking for her ancestors. She found them on the passport applications um, on Ancestry. And um, she's learning how to do genealogy. So she said, don't tell me where it is. Tell me how to do it. So I said, I wrote to her and I said, well, I especially love the picture of your great-grandparents on the passport application. And she wrote back and she goes, what picture? <laughs> it was on the next page. So those are the kinds of things that I think we need to start thinking about if we want to solve our problem. Um, right now, there's this huge, huge um, mission to get newspapers digitized. And Newspaper Archive, um, which was, I, I believe, mentioned, Newspaper Archive is a wonderful resource. It's a, an, a subscription site, but um, I, I'm not sure that Family History Center has it, but we have it at our library. and. Um, it's, it's just incredible what you can find. Um, I found my engagement picture in the Lowell Sun in Massachusetts in the, in the newspaper. It's kind of fun. So you can find lots of things. And, and it's set up in such a way that it'll give you that meat that um, Bill was talking about, the meat on the, on the bones. It'll tell you somebody came to visit. Or one, one article I found said somebody went turtle. It meant he um, rolled his car over. So um, I think you, you really would be really um, well served to try to use some of these newspapers. Uh, one of the um, libraryofcongress.gov has a bunch of newspapers. Uh, it's free. They're called historical newspapers. They, um, in that, some of you got the syllabus. There's a lot of websites in there, and I'm sorry I didn't know that you'd all want them, <laughs> or I would have brought a few more. We had them left over. But libraryofcongress.gov um, has, I think, 10 states. And if you're lucky enough to have one of them, you can do a search on them. But just remember that the searches on these, t these states, um, when they do the, the scanning, it's called optical character recognition. And they don't always pick up the letters the way they're written. Um, an, an easy example is I was doing research for a gentleman, and his, the name was Openshaw. O-P-E-N-S-H-A-W, and it read O-O-E-N. So you have to be imaginative sometimes. If you can't find your name, think about who else might have been in the uh, death notice or who else might have been in the uh, marriage record. But there's all kinds of records like that that you'll just find, w which could just open up a whole new uh, little chink in your, in your wall. Another thing that's really interesting to me, um, when I first started doing genealogy, I 
I just figured everybody just stayed where they, they lived forever and ever, because I was from Massachusetts and my grandparents and great-grandparents from New Hampshire. Well, when I started doing my husband's research, I found out this, this couple, they lived in this place, and then the next time I saw them, they were in another county, and the next time I saw them in another county. Well, guess what? They never moved. They were in the same place, but the county lines changed. <laughs> so you, you need to pay attention to that when you're looking for your research and for your ancestors. Um, I think that's just something that just really, way back, you know, when I did genealogy, I thought, wow, this is really, you know, <laughs> really. Um, and then also, I'm looking at, um, one of the things that I think is really important, especially for people that have done genealogy for a number of years, you need to take all the stuff and go back and do it again. You know, look at what, you're, what you have. Sometimes you just look at things in a different way and you'll see something that you didn't realize you had. I've done that so many times. I think also you need to look and do a timeline. Um, you can type it up, you can write it up, do whatever you want, but sometimes you'll see you've got a missing, well, where were they then? And you can start looking for information. Many of the states have, um, 1855, 1865 censuses, and that might be the key that would help you to find the information. And, and family, uh, family Search has a lot of those um, 1855, 65 censuses. I think also, um, along with the not searching the wives, I think you need to think about searching for the siblings. People often forget that um, they might have been um, more um, well known in the community. And if, it, if you know that like John is Frank's brother and Frank starts talking about his family, that may be the answer that gives you the, the father and the mother and all the brothers and sisters. Um, it's, it's pretty incredible. I've, I've been doing research for this gentleman in Humboldt County, for Humboldt County, and all of a sudden I discovered that his whole family, who either married sisters and everything, they're all there. But it took research to find these obituaries and all this stuff. The whole family came over here in the mid-1800s. So I'm putting it all together and I'm finding out who their, their parents' names were. Um, one of the things that you need to do when you really have a brick wall, and I, about half of you said you've been doing genealogy for a long time. So one of the things that you get down to doing is looking at all the people in the town or the county by the same name who were from the same place and looking at them and saying how are they related and how can I put them together to see if I can get additional information. Um, I spent, I don't know how, a couple of years putting all my Germans together in Cincinnati and I found, I was sure I found who they were. You know, I just knew that that's who they were and I couldn't prove it. So finally I started doing a little bit more research and I put them all together, they're all from Baden, which means you know, that you're like from Georgia or California, and put them together and went to Salt Lake City and with the help of one of the ladies there, we came up with some counties or some towns in Baden and I found them. And it was pure luck, but in the margin of my great-great-grandmother's uh, birth, it said, died in Cincinnati, 1865. Is that proof or what? <laughs> Um, and, it, and there was this one guy in Cincinnati and I couldn't figure out who he was and after I started going through the German records, it was the nephew. It was the cousin, the first cousin. So I have the whole family now and I'm just so excited. Um, also, um, once you've gathered all these people, the another, another approach that you can do is to look at the neighbors and look at people who, if, especially if they've come from another country, look at um, who else came from whatever country they may have been from, because people didn't always travel alone. They traveled either in groups or one person would come to be the scout, and he'd say, okay, it's good, come and, and join us in this place. So you oftentimes may find from information about those neighbors from that country where they were from, and that might give you the name of a town, it might give you um, just that piece of information that breaks your uh, wall. And the one thing that I have to really say is if you have to really pay attention to the spelling of the name, I have people that say, my name is spelled this way, and I'll say, yeah, but the census taker didn't spell it that way. 
And I have, the, the, the most amazing example was this man I was doing research for, and the name was Katik, C-A-T-T-I-C-K. And guess what the name really is? G-O-E-D-E-C-K-E, Getik, Ketik. So it, al it also helps to pronounce the name the way the Germans or the Swedes, like Mary Jakobsen, her name is Jacobson. Guess what she's in the census? Why? Because that's how she pronounced it. Those are the kinds of things that I'd like you to think about. Okay, then quickly, um, you need to look at articles. I never find anybody in my family in, in genealogy Genealogical, genealogical articles, but I love to see how people have solved problems, and they may give you an idea of how you can solve your problem. And then one of the benefits, I think, of the, a genealogical society is that um, we do talk, um, and we, we sit down and we chat, and it's amazing. Even though I've been doing research since the early 80s, somebody will say something and I'll go, I didn't know that. And, and I go back and I can make, make progress on my family. Um, uh, Bill mentioned Google, it's wonderful. Um, I put uh, two other things at the end of this and just because um, there's some, some resources that you can look at that might give you the idea that um, this is something um, that could help you. Um, and my last thing is, when I was in high school, I absolutely hated history. I hated history. When I started doing genealogy, it opened up, my, my great-great-grandfather was in the Civil War, or my, you know, and history is going to really bring a lot of um, solutions to your genealogy, too, because you'll discover, oh, he might have been in the War of 1812. Oh, he might have, um, you know, gone someplace because he was doing that. So think about all these things and really um, try to... Uh, walk around your wall and see if you can find it. Um, and my last thing I want to say is, um, Bill mentioned that we are doing classes. Um, Marge Bell and I have been doing them for about four years, and we're just starting up a new class um, that's starting the 26th of January. Um, if you go on our website, California Ancestors, probably, um, probably at the beginning of February, you'll you can register for it. I mean, beg beginning of January. Um, it's going to be um, eight classes on specific internet sites and how to use them. And I think it's going to be great. We're also having a few on, I, I'm told ethnic is not the right word, but on different countries, beginning genealogy, getting to the country. And I think these um, classes could be really helpful for you. There is a charge because uh, we're poor and we're trying to support our library. But um, we've generously been given um, the opportunity to use the Family History Center to um, have a larger group, a class of at least 40 people. So I hope you'll um, come, and I have really enjoyed hearing uh, my other uh, cohorts here talks tonight, and we'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Okay, well, thank you very much. This is really for the panelists. Uh, apparently, the handouts uh, have been uh, sold out. Well, <laughs> I think so it was this this one. Is that to the extent that uh, uh, is it appropriate if uh, the foundation uh, puts them into a PDF and makes them available? Yeah, on they can the do website. that. Mm -hmm. If not, let us know. And, uh, but otherwise, we'll go ahead and do that. Well, this one I just brought these for fun. These um, and if we have a bunch more at the society, we have a bunch more at the society. Um, I don't know that I can get them here in a timely manner, and you wouldn't get them, but we do have them at the Society, and if you come and visit, um, you can ask for one and they'll give you one. There's about, I think there's another hundred of them there. <laughs> okay, well, let's move into some questions. Um, we're not going to get through all of these questions, so remember <laughs> the panelists will be here afterwards. Uh, first question, how do sites go about getting newspaper archives? How does what? How do, how do one of these computer sites go about getting newspaper mm -hmm. archives? Well, the, the newspapers well, we are scanned. <laughs> the newspapers are scanned by different companies, like Newspaper Archive, like the Library of uh, Congress, um, and also um, there's a group at uh, UC Riverside that do that. So they're continually scanning papers, but again, there's a very small percentage of them that are scanned. You may have to go to the mm -hmm. state library to get um, newspapers in your um, for your state. Okay, uh, maybe Martha, you could deal with this one. Mm -hmm. If your ancestors did not go through Ellis Island, 
Mm. Where else could they have entered, and where do you look to find that information? Ellis Island is a location in New York Harbor. People could have immigrated to any port mm -hmm. in the United States. The reason a lot of people, including my grandmother, who was driving her in-laws so crazy they sold the family cow to send her and two kids under the age of four <laughs> to her husband, who had not yet sent any money from Chicago. But uh, the reason one cow could pay for all those, those fares is that the United States was exporting a lot of raw materials to Europe, and it wasn't importing a whole lot, so they were sort of like human ballast. Mm -hmm. um, so Ellis Island itself didn't get started until the 1890s. Right. Right. People coming in before that were coming into Castle Garden, also in New York City. Um, people on the continent, on European continent, i.e. not the British Isles, would frequently travel from their home country on a ship that then docked at another port in another country where there was a lot of transatlantic traffic. Some countries like Germany and Sweden kept very good records of people leaving the country, but a German or a Swede probably would not have gone directly from that country to the United States, very unlikely with Sweden, slightly more likely with Germany. They probably would have gone, they could, well, most likely to a British port or to some of the French uh, ports, particularly Le Havre. But again, they could come into any particular area. People you first know of in the Midwest may have come into New Orleans, which was a big export location for co uh, cotton, which was fueling all those dark satanic mills, both in Britain and all over uh, Europe. Okay, uh, Bill, maybe you can handle this one. Uh, how could I find the ancestors of someone who came from England in 1620 to the Boston area on one of the Puritan ships, the Lyon. I know the answer to the one. <laughs> Will that Jane answer? On the other she's hand, got the answer on the tip of her Jane, tongue. Jane knows the answer. On I the do. Go ahead, Jane. Well, since I'm a member of the New England Historic Genealogical right. Society, and I'm from Massachusetts, um, there there's a series of books. Um, there's a lot of books. There's one um, called it's by Savage that gives you a lot of information about what people came over on ships. But um, Robert Charles Anderson has been doing this um, series of books called The Great Migration Begins. Mm -hmm. And they have it at the Family History Library. And we have it at our library. It's a wonderful compilation of books. And he's just finished up through, I think, um, 1634. So if they came by then, there's an alphabetical index of all those people. And it's uh, quite helpful. OK. Um. I'm going to take another one, uh, East Coast Immigration. So Jane, keep that mic in, in front of you. Well, if you have a comment, Bill. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, did you want to did you? No, that's fine. No, no, she's okay. doing great. <laughs> what are the best sources for finding 1800 to 1870 era immigration records for Baltimore and Philadelphia? Oh. Ancestry. Mo, do you want to do it? I want to say most of them are. Well, I think most of them will be found on Ancestry.com. Yeah. The ones that mm -hmm. they have. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, uh, this one is for Diane. Uh -huh. Have you been able no, to trace your ancestry back to the first ones in your family to come to the New World or North America? Well, on the uh, line that I talked about this evening, the Hempy line, actually I was able to, and uh, the first ancestor that came over did fight in the American Revolution, but he was a Hessian. <laughs> 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 His name was Johann Heinrich Hempy, and uh, for any of you, and you laugh, but many of us are descended from Hessians. It's surprising, actually, um, the city librarian here is also descended from a Hessian. And a document that you really need to look at is a, a, a German document. It's called the Hetrina Index, and I found Johann there. It told his date of birth. It tells the city that he came from. He was with the Van Bos uh, troops. It told what his position was, and he was captured at the Battle of uh, Yorktown and marched to Frederick, Maryland. So the Hetrina Index is a very, very uh, good resource for anyone who has a Hessian soldier in your background. The Hetrina, it's H-E-T-R-I-N-A Index, and I think I actually looked it up in uh, either the Denver Library or New York because I was traveling, but uh, you can find it uh, in other libraries as well. 
Okay, this one is from Martha. We were told that men, that, let's see, let me see if I can read this right. We were told that many World War I records were destroyed in a fire in St. Louis. Oh, yes. <laughs> Are there duplicates of those destroyed records anywhere? One answer is it beats me. Another answer, though, is those records keep popping up. Um, keep searching is all I can, all I can tell you. Um, try the National Archives site, um, what, archive.gov. Is, is there an S on that? I forgot what I said already. Yeah, archives with an S dot gov uh, to see. But there was a big to do a couple of years ago about the fact that, oh no, we found those records we thought had been burned. So who knows? Okay, uh, Rich, I have an addition to that. I found my father's World War II records, which had been burned, but they were in the California National Guard archives. Mm -hmm. And so they yeah. sent me the whole set of records. Yeah. Okay, so uh, if you look at the National Guard archives to, to try to replace those as well, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, that. that's the state adjutant general reports because your, your person may have gone over as part of the National Guard. This, this is one for everybody uh, based on my string tie. Uh, <laughs> is there a record of the people who came west by stagecoach oh in the my. 1860s? Oh Stagecoach? Stagecoach. Yeah, Come there's away. one, there's, there's two sources, but they don't list everybody. Um, one of them is by Lewis, L-O-U-I-S, Rasmussen, R-A-S-M-U-S-S-E-N, and it's something like Stagecoach Passenger List or California Stagecoach Lists. Uh, sorry, once you retire, it all starts seeping out of your mind. <laughs> um, and that's for Stagecoaches going, going to California. There's another set of like eight and a half by 11, 25 page, uh, you know, per volume, so we're not talking big books, called Goin, G-O-I-N, West. And that is a list primarily based on people leaving St. Louis who are going somewhere west. It's not limited to people for California, mm -hmm. but there is by no means a master list of everybody who came. But those are two possible sources for you. Okay, well, we've run out of time. We want to express appreciation to our excellent panel for all that they've given. <laughs> be careful. Yeah, everybody be careful. Yeah. We would also like to once again thank our sponsors uh, for this particular program Broadway Plaza, Contra Costa Times, Minuteman Press. And if you've enjoyed this program, don't hesitate to uh, donate to the Walnut Creek Library Foundation. Thank you very much, everyone.